Book talk begins at 22 minutes and 17 seconds. Emma begins with episode 649. Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 676, Where Am I Sporing At? This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by our lovely patrons at patreon.com slash craftlet and our channel members over on YouTube. This week, we would like to highlight Kathleen Rogers, Terry Hamilton, Renee Rico, our Revnits, Julie Serrato, and Larry, who, having a good week, Larry? was the winner of Continuous Cables. It was very exciting. Larry has been with me forever and has been exceedingly helpful when things have gone wrong, letting me know quickly so I can fix them quickly. I have come to rely on messages from Larry being like, oh, no, got to get on this one right away because Larry's on it. And oh, boy, do I appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. And now that we're on Discord, it makes it a lot easier to be able to talk to people again like it used to be back in the day and then you know everything got commodified and it got real hard so i'm not getting on that soapbox though i am getting on the heather was a dolt soapbox it's not even a soapbox it's it's not even a speed bump it's basically i'm standing on a rock i i did say that i wanted the raffle for ann's amazing Halloween quilt to be a limited amount of time so that I would have time to ship it. But I think the date that I gave was ridiculous. So I'm not cutting off the raffle until midnight on October 20th. That gives everybody a couple of episodes to be able to get this message and hear this message and then and then I can go out and ship it uh first thing Monday morning on October 21st. So, midnight October 20th, midnight Eastern Time, October 20th is when the raffle is going to end. Please do enter. Yeah, oh, somebody's going to be so happy when they get this. I will be putting up more not just pictures of the quilt, but also some videos so that you can see it in action with me, probably in the picture too. <laughs> and uh, we have, speaking of Anne, we have a, a voicemail from her that is uh, discussed this month's book party, that Tara will be our special co-host. I have now finished the book. I'm listening to it a second time. It is, it is that kind of book. Anne had notes. I'll just play the so, voicemail. Here we go. That was Ann Blanton calling. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh, Heather. If you have watched the Liam Neeson Haunting of Hill House without having watched the Julie Adams the, Haunt, uh, the Haunting, then you have really missed out on the better of the, of the two movie adaptations. For one thing, black and white is always scarier. You know, just no contest. Black and white. Way to go for a horror movie. Second, you know, Russ Tamblin, Julie Adams, Claire Bloom. I mean, we are talking movie, 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 movie. Best movie in the world. No, not really, but, you know, definitely better than the Liam Neeson movie. I'm sorry. I like Liam Neeson. I like the people in the cast of that one, but no, 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 no. You must watch the other one. I insist. I'm going to come up to Pennsylvania and strap you down to your chair and make you watch it. I kid you not. If I don't hear from you, and I'm going to leave the room so you'll be terrified. Wah, ha, ha. So, anyway. And, yes, the book is better than either of that movie adaptations. Later. Bye. 
so is it is it my imagination or was Anne kind of giddy with glee about this movie, The Haunting? I do have uh, a link for you in in the show notes or down in the description for you to go and take a look at the trailer for it. There are actually several trailers, and I, I think I'm going to try and compile all of them so that you can take a look because they're very different. But listen, she she had me at Rust Hamlin. I think Riff in West Side Story may have been my first actor crush, and I'm kind of not making that up. I really actually think that might be true. Is that wrong? <laughs> I don't know, but I've always I've always liked Riff. I've always liked his Riff. The new Riff is great. The Steven Spielberg version was beautiful. I thought I was going to hate it. I didn't hate it. But yeah, Russ Tamlin. Anytime he shows up, I'm going to be happy. So I'm definitely going to watch that. I wonder. I wonder if there's a way that we could do a live stream watching of this on YouTube so everybody could come because it would be like a one-off. If I can find a streamable copy of the film, I don't see why not. All right. If you're interested, help me look and see if we can figure out a way to do this. I know there's the Rave app, but everybody would have to have the secondary thing. Like if I got it on Amazon Prime, everybody who tunes in on Rave would have to be on Amazon Prime too. That may be the easiest way to do it though. I don't know. Somebody send me ideas. Let me know if this is something you'd like to do uh, sometime between now and Halloween. You know, something that you can watch and make comments in the chat while we're watching together. And and that way, if I watch it with you, I won't be so scared. <laughs> okay. So I did go back to the yarn store yesterday. It was their spin in, but only a few spinners showed up and they showed up late. So I was able to get, I don't know, 10 rows done on the map of the world Afghan. And it was, again, lovely, charming, nice to have accountability partners. I almost didn't go because the day had gotten kind of busy for me. And then I thought, no, no, no. I said it in front of God and everybody. I'm going to do it. And I did. And it was great. It's just a lovely, a lovely little shop. And of course, that means I did see people spinning. So now I have found all my spindles and I found a lovely little way to display them as well, which makes me very happy. I've never been able to do that before. But now that the kids are out of the house and we're moving stuff around. I mean, most of the house looks like a jumble sale because I am actively moving things around, but those things that look like a jumble are moving every single day somewhere else. And I'm I'm really excited. I'm really having a good time with it because I've been feeling actually like myself. I have had five days in the last week now where I have felt like me. I haven't had that happen since January. And then I had a six month crash after that. So I'm hoping that this one takes. One of the things that I learned at Twist Yarn Store here in Eastern Pennsylvania is uh, one of the guys who kind of tangentially works there, but also sometimes is just there hanging out because he can. He recommended to a, a, a girl, a young woman, I'm sorry, a young woman who came in because she wanted to knit a pair of socks and she had knit before but not in a long time, but she wasn't afraid of double pointed needles or anything like that. She just kind of needed to get direction. Like I need an easy sock pattern and I'm going to need to buy needles and yarn. And Will said that there is an app called Tin Can Knits, which is spelled exactly how you think it would be. Tin, T-I-N-C-A-N Knits. It's an app. It looks like it's three people who have built this pattern site and they've got this tin can knits app which includes some of their free patterns but also includes tutorials and it's free i'm sure you can spend money on other things but there is plenty of free content on there so if you know somebody who's new to knitting as i do i'm going to be sending this to my friend and yeah, I was really excited to hear about that. And I did get back on my Knit Companion app as he recommended. And lo and behold, yes, there was all of the progress that I had made before on the map of the world Afghan. I was able to resuscitate that. And now that it makes it so much easier to be able to knit this thing because you can zoom in on Estonia where it gets very complicated. But it also was nice to be able to open it while I was there because there were a couple of things that I was confused about. The interface has changed. And for those of you who've been listening since, what was it, 2011, 2012, when this first came out? Oh my gosh, I'm blanking on her name. 
It'll come to me. We'll put it on the screen or in the show notes. She had had all of these plans back there. From what I remember when I talked to her, the app as it is now is how she envisioned it back then. But the tech wasn't there for her back then. And it's a shame, but it's there now. Oh, and one other thing. I saw a review of Knit Companion on YouTube. I don't remember whose channel it was. They did a lovely review. I'm not criticizing the review, but I have the inside scoop that they did not have. And that is when this first started originally, it was pretty much just for iPhone, iOS, iPads, things like that. And there was work being done on getting an Android app up and running. And it was at that time, it was fraught. And it sounds like it may still be fraught. I know why, because I had to ask, because we had a lot of people who were on Android tablets and phones. And the answer was this, Apple may be a, a giant behemoth Goliath corporation when it comes to constricting the flow of product through a very narrow channel. You know, anything that comes from Apple is going to have very specific coding and they're very proprietary about their stuff and all of that. What that means for app developers is that they have to give the app developers code and that code has to be appropriate for all iOS devices or all OS devices, the computers. Because Android's are more, I don't want to say they're more open source, but because the operating systems that they run on are not restricted the same way, I remember, was it Sally? I think it's Sally. I hope it's Sally. Anyway, I remember her telling me that one of the problems they were having with the Android infrastructure was that Samsung phones ran one kind of code, while Windows phones ran a different kind of code, and Motorola phones r rode on the back of a different kind of code. And that since there was no real unified field theory of coding for them, it made it impossible to do something as complicated as Knit Companion on that platform. I don't know if it's still true. I do know that it used to be true. And if you have ever been frustrated by like, why is it that you can only get some of these apps on Apple? Now you know, it is actually easier to develop apps for Apple. But two things for you, Tin Can Knits and Knit Companion. I did go ahead and re-up my prescription, my prescription. Oh my gosh, you can tell <laughs> I've been sick for 18 months. My subscription to Knit Companion, it is one of those things where like I used to say about living in New York City, you didn't mind paying city taxes because you saw your tax dollar at work. You got a lot out of your tax dollar in New York City. State taxes, I was never thrilled about. This is the same thing. Yes, uh, Knit Companion, you pay for it for a year and it's yours for a year and then it's going to re-up in a year. And it's not a small chunk of change. It's, I don't think it's more than 30 I don't think it's more than $30, but still it's more than five. You see every penny of that money on the screen. It works seamlessly with Ravel, with your Ravelry library, with your Dropbox, and with your local uh, on the iPad or on the iPhone storage. So, sproing. I have a sproing question for you. If you've been knitting for a while, and you've ever gone to a Rhinebeck or a Maryland Sheep and Wool or a Stitches East or West, you have most likely encountered the full body contact sport that is buying socks that rock yarns. There are not many yarns that I would willingly dive into a scrum for. Socks that rock actually is probably the only yarn that I would willing to be beaten heavily by other angry yarn buyers. Part of the reason is because I don't know what their base is. I don't know what the magic is that is happening in the background where this yarn base is spun. But clearly, there's a lot of love, both in the, the spinning and in the dyeing. And there is a lot of precision. And I appreciate both of those things. But mostly what I appreciate is the springiness of their yarn. And what do I mean by that? 
I am actually holding some of this yarn right now. And I am, if you're watching on YouTube, you will see my hands demonstrate the sproing. And if we can embed a short video into the, the craftlet.com show notes or into the Patreon show notes, we will try and do that because it's, it is rather unique, this yarn. It's not quite worsted. It's bigger than DK. And I actually have my spinning gauge with me because I found it when I got my spindles out. And I believe, I think the closest is 14 wraps per inch. So for those of you who spin, that will make more sense. I find that the whole DK oh, worsted and everything, lace weight is always lace weight, but everything else to me feels very squishy. And I don't like thin sock yarn. I go through sock heels way too fast. I need something that is sturdy. The first socks that I ever knit with socks that rock, I still wear. And in fact, the first socks that I ever spun, I am wearing right now. I have gone through the heel and the instep on these several times. I have darned them. And then finally, I started using one of those little speed weave things on them. And boy, the patches that I made with the speed weave are awesome. Both indestructible and I can't feel them. You know, they're not lumpy. They're not a bad darn. They are, they are a darn good darn is what they are. So why did I bring this up? I need help because I took this yarn to the yarn store. Now, I'm not positive that what I'm knitting with right now is socks that rock. I do still, like I said, have socks that I've knit with socks that rock. And I do have some very clearly colorful socks that rock yarn. I am 98% certain that this is too, but I've lost the ball band. So that's problem number one. And problem number two is I like to support local, local to, to here, uh, Eastern Pennsylvania. I like to support local spinners and dyers and I want to, but I don't want to buy yarn that I'm not going to use. And I'm old enough now that I get to be cantankerous and say, no, I need some sproing. I need a firm ply where where the twist is solid. It's not going anywhere. It's hard to split. Not impossible. It's always possible to split the yarn, especially if you have, you know, really sharp addies or something. But I like the not plain one color, but slightly variegated. I also have fun with the pretty majorly variegated, but I'm I am happy with subtle color changes as well. But the dye to me really has become secondary to finding some company other than socks. Well, actually, socks that rock, if I can get some on sale, would be fine. But I am not in a position financially right now where I can go drop that kind of money on a skein of yarn. So I need a substitute. And I don't know if you can get this kind of springiness from any other yarn source these days. If you know of any particularly springy yarn that would make a good sock, this is not thin sock weight yarn. I don't like making socks out of the thin. I like it not out of worsted, but this is a like a thick DK. Uh, I think it's 46 stitches that I cast on as just kind of a normal cast on amount. It's either 46 or 52, but it is definitely not 70s. Like I, I have some socks that you had to cast on 74 because the yarn was so thin. These are not those. Anyway, if you know of anything that you think is comparable or worth checking out and also not going to uh, break my bank, please let me know. You can always email heather at craftlit.com or call 206-350-1642 and, uh, and let me know. And I'll share what you share with everybody so everybody can share in the benefit of your knowledge. <laughs> uh, keep your eyes open on my Instagram. You will see what I have been doing this weekend while I was feeling good. I'm not going to get into it right now, but I am going to say I learned what a chinois is. And if it were mortal, I would have run off with it. <laughs> and I think Andrew knows that. 
my mom got this for me when we went to an antique store. It is a vintage chinois. And I can't even describe how much easier it was to strain yogurt, to make soup, to strain the crabapple, chili, jelly, and cheese. All of these recipes that I've been making are going to be, well, I'll put links in the show notes and then they'll also be named on Instagram. And I'll try and put links in the comments on the Instagram post as well so you can see. Last thing before we get into our chapters today, uh, which, which actually kind of relate beautifully. Uh, if you haven't already heard about or watched the new Netflix rom-com series, Nobody Wants That, it's Kristen Bell. It's Adam Brody. I guess he was on like the OC or I don't know, stuff like that, that I, that I missed because I was too old to be watching pretty much any TV at that time and too young to have had kids who were of the age that they were watching it. So I missed him entirely. He's lovely and charming. Kristen Bell, you know, <laughs> can make anything, anything tragic, very pleasantly entertaining. It is not a tragedy though. These are complicated people. These are adult people who are behaving like adults, who are learning how to love each other. And every time in this show that they walk up to a stupid rom-com or sitcom trope, like, oh, there's this misunderstanding and now it's going to be weeks before we deal with, oh, if only they'd heard the truth. None of those cliches last more than a full episode, if even several scenes, because these are adult people who actually talk to each other. And it's one of the few things that you will ever find where, uh, spoiler alert, it's not that big a spoiler, uh, when the sexual tension is broken, these people are still fun. Like the only other couples I could think of were Nick and Nora in the Thin Man series. Oh, which reminds me, that's going to be one of our book movie pair-ups for 2025 is The Thin Man. Ha, I just remembered. So if you need a rom-com, they dump the whole thing. It's all 10 episodes. It's there. It's lovely. It's wonderful. And I can't wait for the second season. How does that relate? Well, you know the rom-com thing. Today, we have two chapters, crucial, very, very important chapters. And I am going to ask you to do me a favor with the first one. I feel like we have all had our issues with Frank, right? There, mm, Frank has not behaved beautifully. Knightley's criticisms of him were certainly well-founded. However, please do me a favor. When you are listening to chapter 14, where Emma reads the letter from Frank that Frank sends to Mrs. Weston and tells her to send it to Emma so Emma can read it too. Remember two things. Number one, we are supposed to feel this way about him, but we are not supposed to be modern, cynical people who only ever expect cads. It is very possible for a guy to be a guy guy and also to be non-toxic. So, you have to kind of put yourself into the mindset of, okay, let's just take this letter at face value and believe that he is saying what he is saying, honestly, not manipulatively. Okay. Can you do that? Because there are going to be places in this letter where you're going to go, Heather, really seriously? And I'm going to say, yes, just be patient with me. And also have, a, have an open mind about uh, how Irma deals with Harriet in the first chapter today. We'll talk a little bit about uh, Harriet's situation with Emma after the chapter, but just keep in mind, oh, that's so contrived. Sure. And it, yes, Austin needed to do this for storytelling reasons. But Jane Austen is a good enough writer that I, I think she actually has real character-driven reasons for this decision as well. So we'll talk about that on the flip side. There is one thing that if you don't see it, and you're only listening to the chapter, you, you may not even hear it, but it is something that would definitely stop your eye, uh, unless you know Latin. It's something that would stop your eye if you were reading it, and that is this. Frank is going to refer to the thing that happened on the 26th of last month. 
Now, I have heard the word penultimate used quite a bit. It's not the ultimate, it's the last thing. It's the thing before the last thing. Well, it turns out that this is actually a Latin thing thing. So an instant mens, M-E-N-S-E, is this month, instant, right now. The ultimo mens is last month, the ultimate, the, the last complete month that you went through. The penultimate month would be the one before that. So Frank writes about the event of the 26th ult, U-L-T, period, comma. That's, it's like saying, etc. It's just something that people did and they knew it and this is not weird. It just is now. <laughs> it wasn't weird then. So uh, I've never come across that. I think that's pretty cool. And I think we should all start doing this all the time so we can teach everybody through example. <laughs> How cool it is. It's like ruthless. Nobody uses the word Ruth anymore except the Bronte sisters. And here we go. Alt, alt instead of just, just penultimate. Now you can have penultimate and ultimate. I love it. All right. Let's listen to chapters 50 and 51. That would be volume three, chapters 14 and 15 of Jane Austen's Emma. Let's go. Volume 3, Chapter 14 What totally different feelings did Emma take back into the house from what she had brought out? She had then been only daring to hope for a little respite of suffering. She was now in an exquisite flutter of happiness, and such happiness, moreover, as she believed must still be greater when the flutter should have passed away. They sat down to tea, the same party round the same table, how often it had been collected— and how often had her eyes fallen on the same shrubs in the lawn, and observed the same beautiful effect of the western sun! But never in such a state of spirits, never in anything like it, and it was with difficulty that she could summon enough of her usual self to be the attentive lady of the house, or even the attentive daughter. Poor Mr. Woodhouse little suspected what was plotting against him in the breast of that man whom he was so cordially welcoming, and so anxiously hoping might not have taken cold from his ride— could he have seen the heart, he would have cared very little for the lungs, but without the most distant imagination of the impending evil, without the slightest perception of anything extraordinary in the looks or ways of either, he repeated to them very comfortably all the articles of news he had received from Mr. Perry, and talked on with much self-contentment, totally unsuspicious of what they could have told him in return. As long as Mr. Knightley remained with them, Emma's fever continued— but when he was gone she began to be a little tranquilized and subdued, and in the course of the sleepless night, which was the tax for such an evening, she found one or two such very serious points to consider as made her feel that even her happiness must have some alloy, her father and Harriet. She could not be alone without feeling the full weight of their separate claims, and how to guard the comfort of both to the utmost was the question. With respect to her father it was a question soon answered. She hardly knew yet what Mr. Knightley would ask, but a very short parley with her own heart produced the most solemn resolution of never quitting her father. She even wept over the idea of it as a sin of thought. While he lived it must be only an engagement. But she flattered herself that if divested of the danger of drawing her away, it might become an increase of comfort to him. How to do her best by Harriet was of more difficult decision— how to spare her from any unnecessary pain, how to make her any possible atonement, how to appear least her enemy. On these subjects her perplexity and distress were very great, and her mind had to pass again and again through every bitter reproach and sorrowful regret that had ever surrounded it. She could only resolve at last that she would still avoid a meeting with her, and communicate all that need be told by letter— that it would be inexpressibly desirable to have her removed just now for a time from Highbury, and, indulging in one more scheme, nearly resolved that it might be practicable to get an invitation for her to Brunswick Square. Isabella had been pleased with Harriet, and a few weeks spent in London must give her some amusement. She did not think it in Harriet's nature to escape being benefited by novelty and variety, by the streets, the shops, and the children. At any rate, it would be a proof of attention and kindness in herself, from whom everything was due, a separation for the present, an averting of the evil day when they must all be together again. 
She rose early and wrote her letter to Harriet, an employment which left her so very serious, so nearly sad, that Mr. Knightley, in walking up to Hartfield to breakfast, did not arrive at all too soon, and half an hour stolen afterwards to go over the same ground again with him, literally and figuratively, was quite necessary to reinstate her in a proper share of the happiness of the evening before. He had not long left her, by no means long enough for her to have the slightest inclination for thinking of anybody else, when a letter was brought her from Randall's, a very thick letter. She guessed what it must contain, and deprecated the necessity of reading it. She was now in perfect charity with Frank Churchill. She wanted no explanations. She wanted only to have her thoughts to herself, and as for understanding anything he wrote, she was sure she was incapable of it. It must be waded through, however. She opened the packet. It was too surely so. A note from Mrs. Weston to herself ushered in the letter from Frank to Mrs. Weston. I have the greatest pleasure, my dear Emma, in forwarding to you the enclosed. I know what thorough justice you will do it, and have scarcely a doubt of its happy effect. I think we shall never materially disagree about the writer again, but I will not delay you by a long preface. We are quite well. This letter has been the cure of all the little nervousness I have been feeling lately. I did not quite like your looks on Tuesday, but it was an ungenial morning, and though you will never own being affected by weather, I think everybody feels a northeast wind. I felt for your dear father very much in the storm of Tuesday afternoon and yesterday morning, but had the comfort of hearing last night by Mr. Perry that it had not made him ill. Yours ever, A. W. To Mrs. Weston, Windsor, July. My dear madam, if I made myself intelligible yesterday, this letter will be expected, but expected or not, I know it will be read with candour and indulgence. You are all goodness, and I believe there will be need of even all your goodness to allow for some parts of my past conduct. But I have been forgiven by one who had still more to resent. My courage rises while I write it. It is very difficult for the prosperous to be humble. I have already met with such success in two applications for pardon, that I may be in danger of thinking myself too sure of yours, and of those among your friends who have had any ground of offence. You must all endeavour to comprehend the exact nature of my situation when I first arrived at Randall's. You must consider me as having a secret which was to be kept at all hazards. This was the fact. My right to place myself in a situation requiring such concealment is another question. I shall not discuss it here. For my temptation to think it a right, I refer every cavaller to a brick house, sashed windows below, and casements above, in Highbury. I dared not address her openly. My difficulties in the then state of Enscombe must be too well known to require definition, and I was fortunate enough to prevail before we parted at Weymouth, and to induce the most upright female mind in the creation to stoop in charity to a secret engagement. Had she refused, I should have gone mad. But you will be ready to say what was your hope in doing this. What did you look forward to? To anything, everything— to time, chance, circumstance, slow effects, sudden bursts, perseverance and weariness, health and sickness. Every possibility of good was before me, and the first of blessings secured in obtaining her promises of faith and correspondence. If you need farther explanation, I have the honour, my dear madam, of being your husband's son, and the advantage of inheriting a disposition to hope for good, which no inheritance of houses or lands can ever equal the value of. See me, then, under these circumstances, arriving on my first visit to Randall's, and here I am conscious of wrong, for that visit might have been sooner paid. You will look back and see that I did not come till Miss Fairfax was in Highbury, and as you were the person slighted, you will forgive me instantly. But I must work on my father's compassion by reminding him that so long as I absented myself from his house, so long I lost the blessing of knowing you." My behaviour during the very happy fortnight which I spent with you did not, I hope, lay me open to reprehension, excepting on one point. And now I come to the principal, the only important part of my conduct while belonging to you, which excites my own anxiety, or requires very solicitous explanation. With the greatest respect and the warmest friendship do I mention Miss Woodhouse. My father, perhaps, will think I ought to add, with the deepest humiliation— a few words which dropped from him yesterday spoke his opinion, and some censure I acknowledge myself liable to. My behaviour to Miss Woodhouse indicated, I believe, more than it ought. In order to assist a concealment so essential to me, I was led on to make more than an allowable use of the sort of intimacy into which we were immediately thrown. 
I cannot deny that Miss Woodhouse was my ostensible object. But I am sure you will believe the declaration, that had I not been convinced of her indifference, I would not have been induced by any selfish views to go on. Amiable and delightful as Miss Woodhouse is, she never gave me the idea of a young woman likely to be attached, and that she was perfectly free from any tendency to being attached to me was as much my conviction as my wish. She received my attentions with an easy, friendly, good-humoured playfulness which exactly suited me. We seemed to understand each other. From our relative situation those attentions were her due, and were felt to be so. Whether Miss Woodhouse really began to understand me before the expiration of that fortnight, I cannot say. When I called to take leave of her, I remember that I was within a moment of confessing the truth, and I then fancied she was not without suspicion. But I have no doubt of her having since detected me, at least in some degree. She may not have surmised the whole, but her quickness must have penetrated a part. I cannot doubt it. You will find, whenever the subject becomes freed from its present restraints, that it did not take her wholly by surprise. She frequently gave me hints of it. I remember her telling me at the ball that I owed Mrs. Elton gratitude for her attentions to Miss Fairfax. I hope this history of my conduct towards her will be admitted by you and my father as great extenuation of what you saw amiss. While you considered me as having sinned against Emma Woodhouse, I could deserve nothing from either. Acquit me here, and procure for me, when it is allowable, the acquittal and good wishes of that said Emma Woodhouse, whom I regard with so much brotherly affection, as to long to have her deeply and as happily in love as myself. Whatever strange things I said or did during that fortnight, you have now a key to. My heart was in Highbury, and my business was to get my body thither as often as might be, and with the least suspicion. If you remember any queernesses, set them all down to the right account. Of the piano forte so much talked of, I feel it only necessary to say that its being ordered was absolutely unknown to Miss F., who would never have allowed me to send it had any choice been given her. The delicacy of her mind throughout the whole engagement, my dear madam, is much beyond my power of doing justice to. You will soon, I earnestly hope, know her thoroughly yourself. No description can describe her. She must tell you herself what she is, yet not by word, for never was there a human creature who would so designedly suppress her own merit. Since I began this letter, which will be longer than I foresaw, I have heard from her. She gives a good account of her own health, but as she never complains, I dare not depend. I want to have your opinion of her looks. I know you will soon call on her. She is living in a dread of the visit. Perhaps it is paid already. Let me hear from you without delay. I am impatient for a thousand particulars. Remember how few minutes I was at Randall's, and in how bewildered, how mad a state, and I am not much better yet, still insane either from happiness or misery. When I think of the kindness and favour I have met with, of her excellence and patience, and my uncle's generosity, I am mad with joy. But when I recollect all the uneasiness I occasioned her, and how little I deserve to be forgiven, I am mad with anger. If I could but see her again! But I must not propose it yet. My uncle has been too good for me to encroach. I must still add to this long letter. You have not heard all that you ought to hear. I could not give any connected detail yesterday, but the suddenness, and in one light, the unseasonableness with which the affair burst out, needs explanation. For though the event of the twenty-sixth, as you will conclude, immediately opened me the happiest prospects, I should not have presumed on such early measures, but from the very particular circumstances, which left me not an hour to lose. I should myself have shrunk from anything so hasty, and she would have felt every scruple of mine with multiplied strength and refinement. But I had no choice. The hasty engagement she had entered into with that woman— Here, my dear madam, I was obliged to leave off abruptly to recollect and compose myself— I have been walking over the country, and am now, I hope, rational enough to make the rest of my letter what it ought to be. It is, in fact, a most mortifying retrospect for me. I behaved shamefully. And here I can admit that my manners to Miss W., in being unpleasant to Miss F., were highly blamable. She disapproved them, which ought to have been enough. My plea of concealing the truth she did not think sufficient. She was displeased. I thought unreasonably so. I thought her, on a thousand occasions, unnecessarily scrupulous and cautious. I thought her even cold. But she was always right. If I had followed her judgment, and subdued my spirits to the level of what she deemed proper, I should have escaped the greatest unhappiness I have ever known. We quarrelled. Do you remember the morning spent at Donwell? 
There, every little dissatisfaction that had occurred before came to a crisis. I was late. I met her walking home by herself, and I wanted to walk with her, but she would not suffer it. She absolutely refused to allow me, which I then thought most unreasonable. Now, however, I see nothing in it but a very natural and consistent degree of discretion. While I, to blind the world to our engagement, was behaving one hour with objectionable particularity to another woman, was she to be consenting the next to a proposal which might have made every previous caution useless? Had we been met walking together between Donwell and Highbury, the truth must have been suspected. I was mad enough, however, to resent. I doubted her affection. I doubted it more the next day on Box Hill, when provoked by such conduct on my side, such shameful, insolent neglect of her, and such apparent devotion to Miss W., as it would have been impossible for any woman of sense to endure, she spoke her resentment in a form of words perfectly intelligible to me. In short, my dear madam, it was a quarrel blameless on her side, abominable on mine, and I returned the same evening to Richmond, though I might have stayed with you till the next morning, merely because I would be as angry with her as possible. Even then I was not such a fool as not to mean to be reconciled in time, but I was the injured person, injured by her coldness, and I went away determined that she should make the first advances. I shall always congratulate myself that you were not of the Box Hill party. Had you witnessed my behaviour there, I can hardly suppose you would ever have thought well of me again. Its effect upon her appears in the immediate resolution it produced. As soon as she found I was really gone from Randall, she closed with the offer of that officious Mrs. Elton, the whole system of whose treatment of her, by the by, has ever filled me with indignation and hatred. I must not quarrel with the spirit of forbearance which has been so richly extended towards myself, but otherwise I should loudly protest against the share of it which that woman has known. Jane, indeed! You will observe that I have not yet indulged myself in calling her by that name, even to you. Think, then, what I must have endured in hearing it bandied between the Eltons with all the vulgarity of needless repetition, and all the insolence of imaginary superiority. Have patience with me. I shall soon have done. She closed with this offer, resolving to break with me entirely, and wrote the next day to tell me that we were never to meet again— she felt the engagement to be a source of repentance and misery to each. She dissolved it. This letter reached me on the very morning of my poor aunt's death. I answered it within an hour, but from the confusion of my mind and the multiplicity of business falling on me at once, my answer, instead of being sent with all the many other letters of the day, was locked up in my writing-desk, and I, trusting that I had written enough, though but a few lines to satisfy her, remained without any uneasiness. I was rather disappointed that I did not hear from her again speedily, but I made excuses for her and was too busy, and, may I add, too cheerful in my views to be captious. We removed to Windsor, and two days afterwards I received a parcel from her, my own letters all returned, and a few lines at the same time by the post, stating her extreme surprise at not having had the smallest reply to her last, and adding that as silence on such a point could not be misconstrued, and as it must be equally desirable to both to have every subordinate arrangement concluded as soon as possible, she now sent me, by a safe conveyance, all my letters, and requested that if I could not directly command hers, so as to send them to Highbury within a week, I would forward them after that period to her at— in short, the full direction to Mr. Smallridge's near Bristol stared me in the face. I knew the name, the place, I knew all about it, and instantly saw what she had been doing. It was perfectly accordant with that resolution of character which I knew her to possess, and the secrecy she had maintained, as to any such design in her former letter, was equally descriptive of its anxious delicacy. For the world would not she have seemed to threaten me. Imagine the shock! Imagine how, till I had actually detected my own blunder, I raved at the blunders of the post! What was to be done? One thing only. I must speak to my uncle. Without his sanction I could not hope to be listened to again. I spoke. Circumstances were in my favour. The late event had softened away all his pride, and he was, earlier than I could have anticipated, wholly reconciled and complying and could say at last, poor man, with a deep sigh, that he wished I might find as much happiness in the marriage state as he had done. I felt that it would be of a different sort. Are you disposed to pity me for what I must have suffered in opening the cause to him, for my suspense while all was at stake? No, do not pity me till I reached Highbury, and saw how ill I had made her. Do not pity me till I saw her wan, sick looks— I received Highbury at the time of day when, from my knowledge of their late breakfast hour, I was certain of a good chance of finding her alone. I was not disappointed. 
and at last I was not disappointed either in the object of my journey. A great deal of very reasonable, very just displeasure I had to persuade away, but it is done. We are reconciled, dearer, much dearer than ever, and no moment's uneasiness can ever occur between us again. Now, my dear madam, I will release you, but I could not conclude before. A thousand and a thousand thanks for all the kindness you have ever shown me, and ten thousand for the attentions your heart will dictate towards her. If you think me in a way to be happier than I deserve, I am quite of your opinion. Miss W. calls me the child of good fortune. I hope she is right. In one respect, my good fortune is undoubted, that of being able to subscribe myself, your obliged and affectionate son, F. C. Weston Churchill. End of chapter 14. Volume 3, chapter 15. This letter must make its way to Emma's feelings. She was obliged, in spite of her previous determination to the contrary, to do it all the justice that Mrs. Weston foretold. As soon as she came to her own name, it was irresistible. Every line relating to herself was interesting, and almost every line agreeable. And when this charm ceased, the subject could still maintain itself by the natural return of her former regard for the writer, and the very strong attraction which any picture of love must have for her at that moment. She never stopped till she had gone through the whole, and though it was impossible not to feel that he had been wrong, yet he had been less wrong than she had supposed, and he had suffered and was very sorry, and he was so grateful to Mrs. Weston, and so much in love with Miss Fairfax, and she was so happy herself, that there was no being severe, and could he have entered the room, she must have shaken hands with him as heartily as ever. She thought so well of the letter that when Mr. Knightley came again she desired him to read it. She was sure of Mrs. Weston's wishing it to be communicated, especially to one who, like Mr. Knightley, had seen so much to blame in his conduct. "'I shall be very glad to look it over,' said he. "'But it seems long. I will take it home with me at night.' But that would not do. Mr. Weston was to call in the evening, and she must return it by him. "'I would rather be talking to you,' he replied. "'But as it seems a matter of justice, it shall be done.' He began, stopping, however, almost directly to say, "'Had I been offered the sight of one of this gentleman's letters to his mother-in-law a few months ago, Emma, it would not have been taken with such indifference.' He proceeded a little further, reading to himself, and then, with a smile, observed, hm, "'A fine complimentary opening. But it is his way. One man's style must not be the rule of another's. We will not be severe. It will be natural for me,' he added shortly afterwards, to speak my opinion aloud as I read. By doing it I shall feel that I am near you. It will not be so great a loss of time, but if you dislike it— Not at all. I should wish it. Mr. Knightley returned to his reading with greater alacrity. He trifles here, said he, as to the temptation. He knows he is wrong and has nothing rational to urge. Bad. He ought not to have formed the engagement. His father's disposition— he is unjust, however, to his father. Mr. Weston's sanguine temper was a blessing on all his upright and honourable exertions, but Mr. Weston earned every present comfort before he endeavoured to gain it. Very true. He did not come till Miss Fairfax was here. And I have not forgotten, said Emma, how sure you were that he might have come sooner if he would. You pass it over very handsomely, but you were perfectly right. I was not quite impartial in my judgment, Emma— but yet I think, had you not been in the case, I should still have distrusted him. When he came to Miss Woodhouse, he was obliged to read the whole of it aloud, all that related to her, with a smile, a look, a shake of the head, a word or two of assent or disapprobation, or merely of love as the subject required, concluding, however, seriously, and after steady reflection, thus, "'Very bad, though it might have been worse,' playing a most dangerous game, too much indebted to the event for his acquittal, no judge of his own manners by you, always deceived in fact by his own wishes and regardless of little besides his own convenience, fancying you to have fathomed his secret, natural enough, his own mind full of intrigue that he should suspect it in others, mystery, finesse, how they pervert the understanding. My Emma— does not everything serve to prove more and more the beauty of truth and sincerity in all our dealings with each other? Emma agreed to it, and with a blush of sensibility on Harriet's account, which she could not give any sincere explanation of. You had better go on, said she. 
He did so, but very soon stopped again to say, "'The piano forte! Ah, that was the act of a very, very young man, one too young to consider whether the inconvenience of it might not very much exceed the pleasure. A boyish scheme, indeed. I cannot comprehend a man's wishing to give a woman any proof of affection which he knows she would rather dispense with, and he did know that she would have prevented the instrument's coming if she could.' After this he made progress without any pause. Frank Churchill's confession of having behaved shamefully was the first thing to call for more than a word in passing. "'I perfectly agree with you, sir,' was then his remark. "'You did behave very shamefully. You never wrote a truer line.' And having gone through what immediately followed of the basis of their disagreement, and his persisting to act in direct opposition to Jane Fairfax's sense of right, he made a fuller pause to say, "'This is very bad.' He had induced her to place herself, for his sake, in a situation of extreme difficulty and uneasiness, and it should have been his first object to prevent her from suffering unnecessarily. She must have had much more to contend with in carrying on the correspondence than he could. He should have respected even such unreasonable scruples had there been such, but hers were all reasonable. We must look to her one fault, and remember that she had done a wrong thing in consenting to the engagement, to bear that she should have been in such a state of punishment." Emma knew that he was now getting to the Box Hill party, and grew uncomfortable. Her own behaviour had been so very improper. She was deeply ashamed, and a little afraid of his next look. It was all read, however, steadily, attentively, and without the smallest remark, and excepting one momentary glance at her, instantly withdrawn, in the fear of giving pain, no remembrance of Box Hill seemed to exist. "'There is no saying much for the delicacy of our good friends the Eltons,' was his next observation. His feelings are natural. What, actually resolved to break with him entirely? She felt the engagement to be a source of repentance and misery to each. She dissolved it. What a view this gives of her sense of his behaviour! Well, he must be a most extraordinary— Nay, nay, read on. You will find how very much he suffers. I hope he does, replied Mr. Knightley coolly, and resuming the letter. Smallridge, what does this mean? What is all this? She had engaged to go as governess to Mrs. Smorge's children, a dear friend of Mrs. Elton's, a neighbour of Maple Grove. And by the by, I wonder how Mrs. Elton bears the disappointment. Say nothing, my dear Emma, while you oblige me to read, not even of Mrs. Elton. Only one page more I shall soon have done. What a letter the man writes! I wish you would read it with the kindest spirit towards him. Well, there is feeling here. He does seem to have suffered in finding her ill— "'Certainly I can have no doubt of his being fond of her. "'Dearer, much dearer than ever. "'I hope he may long continue to feel all the value of such a reconciliation. "'He is a very liberal thanker with his thousands and tens of thousands. "'Happier than I deserve. Come, he knows himself there. "'Miss Woodhouse calls me the child of good fortune. "'Those were Miss Woodhouse's words, were they? "'And a fine ending. And there is the letter. "'The child of good fortune.' That was your name for him, was it? You do not appear so well satisfied with his letter as I am, but still you must, at least I hope you must, think the better of him for it. I hope it does him some service with you. Yes, certainly it does. He has had great faults, faults of inconsideration and thoughtlessness, and I am very much of his opinion in thinking him likely to be happier than he deserves. But still, as he is, beyond a doubt, really attached to Miss Fairfax, and will soon, it may be hoped, have the advantage of being constantly with her, I am very ready to believe his character will improve, and acquire from hers the steadiness and delicacy of principle that it wants. And now, let me talk to you of something else. I have another person's interest at present so much at heart, that I cannot think any longer about Mr. Frank Churchill— Ever since I left you this morning, Emma, my mind has been hard at work on one subject. The subject followed. It was in plain, unaffected, gentlemanlike English, such as Mr. Knightley used even to the woman he was in love with, how to be able to ask her to marry him without attacking the happiness of her father. Emma's answer was ready at the first word. While her dear father lived, any change of condition must be impossible for her. She could never quit him. Part only of this answer, however, was admitted. The impossibility of her quitting her father, Mr. Knightley felt as strongly as herself, but the inadmissibility of any other change he could not agree to. He had been thinking it over most deeply, most intently. He had at first hoped to induce Mr. Woodhouse to remove with her to Donwell. He had wanted to believe it feasible, 
but his knowledge of Mr. Woodhouse would not suffer him to deceive himself long, and now he confessed his persuasion that such a transplantation would be a risk to her father's comfort, perhaps even of his life, which must not be hazarded. Mr. Woodhouse taken from Hartfield! No, he felt that it ought not to be attempted. But the plan which had arisen on the sacrifice of this, he trusted his dearest Emma would not find in any respect objectionable. It was that he should be received at Hartfield, that so long as her father's happiness, in other words, his life, required Hartfield to continue her home, it should be his likewise. Of their all removing to Donwell, Emma had already had her own passing thoughts. Like him she had tried the scheme and rejected it, but such an alternative as this had not occurred to her. She was sensible of all the affection it evinced. She felt that, in quitting Donwell, he must be sacrificing a great deal of independence of hours and habits, that in living constantly with her father, and in no house of his own, there would be much, very much, to be borne with. She promised to think of it, and advised him to think of it more, but he was fully convinced that no reflection could alter his wishes or his opinion on the subject. He had given it, he could assure her, very long and calm consideration. He had been walking away from William Larkins the whole morning to have his thoughts to himself. "'Ah, there is one difficulty unprovided for,' cried Emma. "'I am sure William Larkins will not like it.' You must get his consent before you ask mine. She promised, however, to think of it, and pretty nearly promised, moreover, to think of it with the intention of finding it a very good scheme. It is remarkable that Emma, in the many, very many points of view in which she was now beginning to consider Donwell Abbey, was never struck with any sense of injury to her nephew Henry, whose rights as heir expectant had formerly been so tenaciously regarded. Think she must of the possible difference to the poor little boy, and yet she only gave herself a saucy, conscious smile about it, and found amusement in detecting the real cause of that violent dislike of Mr. Knightley's marrying Jane Fairfax, or anybody else, which at the time she had wholly imputed to the amiable solicitude of the sister and the aunt. This proposal of his, this plan of marrying and continuing at Hartfield, the more she contemplated it, the more pleasing it became— his evils seemed to lessen, her own advantages to increase, their mutual good to outweigh every drawback. Such a companion for herself in the periods of anxiety and cheerlessness before her, such a partner in all those duties and cares to which time must be giving increase of melancholy. She would have been too happy but for poor Harriet. But every blessing of her own seemed to involve and advance the sufferings of her friend, who must now be even excluded from Hartfield. The delightful family party which Emma was securing for herself, poor Harriet must, in mere charitable caution, be kept at a distance from. She would be a loser in every way. Emma could not deplore her future absence as any deduction from her own enjoyment. In such a party Harriet would be rather a dead weight than otherwise, but for the poor girl herself it seemed a peculiarly cruel necessity that was to be placing her in such a state of unmerited punishment. In time, of course, Mr. Knightley would be forgotten, that is, supplanted, but this could not be expected to happen very early. Mr. Knightley himself would be doing nothing to assist the cure, not like Mr. Elton. Mr. Knightley, always so kind, so feeling, so truly considerate for everybody, would never deserve to be less worshipped than now, and it really was too much to hope, even of Harriet, that she could be in love with more than three men in one year. End of chapter 15。Okay. Do you understand now why I wanted you to listen to Frank's letter in the spirit that he sent it? Whether he was trying to be manipulative or not, we were never going to fully believe Frank because. Jane Austen gives us Mr. Knightley's reading of the letter, where for us, he gets to make all of the criticism and raise his eyebrows and, you know, make cracks about parts of the letter. But it gives us an opportunity to see, yes, we were right to be upset about these things. And if Mr. Knightley is finding reason enough to give Frank some, some grace to grow, some space to grow, and to try and take ownership 
of his own bad behavior, which I, I think we can all agree he he does, even if he's being manipulative about it. He doesn't leave anything out. And he certainly doesn't stop criticizing himself. He also praises himself quite a few times, but he doesn't shy away from some of the more egregious behavior that he displayed. Also, he's really embarrassed about Box Hill too. So he and, he and Emma really do have some interesting connections on a friend level that I don't know that we see that very often in literature or film where the guy and the girl both have reasons to regret an event, but for different reasons. I don't know if this is making any sense. It just feels, it feels like a lovely little puzzle piece put together that they, they both blew it on Box Hill Day for different reasons. I also loved Jane Austen's joke at the beginning of our first chapter today, where, you know, poor Mr. Woodhouse is worried about poor Mr. Knightley and poor Mr. Knightley's lungs having been out in the cold and, oh my goodness. And then Emma's, it's not Emma, it's Jane Austen. Jane Austen's comment is, could he have seen the heart of Mr. Knightley? He would have cared very little for the lungs because he would be so angry that Mr. Knightley was going to take Emma away from him except they're going to work it out, which I love. And I love I love that Emma is devoted enough to her father for good reasons, for lots of good reasons, that she's not willing to hurt him, especially because right now the friendship with Mr. Knightley is at least as important as the future love together. I mean, the, the friendship was the thing that both of them were very afraid they were going to lose. So yeah, I do love that about Emma. I think that's an awfully mature... I mean, we might cynically look at it today and go, wow, that's codependent. But I don't think so. I think this is just a loving relationship. Again, he is not Mr. Fairley in The Women in White. He's not Tolkien Horn. <laughs> Uh, anyway, the thing about Harriet and getting Harriet out of the way by sending her to London, is it a practical maneuver on Jane Austen's part? Yes. Is it a little contrived? Sure. Is it manipulative? Probably on Emma's part, but it's also really the best decision that she could have made. She is sending Harriet, who's probably never been to London, to go stay in London with family, friends who care about her quite a bit and who have children. So it's going to be a completely different environment for her. Nothing that will remind her of Emma and Mr. Knightley. Even though she is going to be staying with Mr. Knightley's brother, they don't look alike, has already been stated. And his manner, his demeanor is very different from our Mr. Knightley. So even that isn't going to be, you know, poking at the nerve on a, a tooth that cracked. It's She's going to be better off. And she is, in fact, and she says it, relieved to be able to get out of Dodge for a little while. But I also think that for somebody who has not had uh, opportunities to travel or anything like this, this would be honestly a very exciting way to get out of it. I mean, anytime we've gone through bad breakups, one of the things I know that I have wanted to do is get away. I don't want to see anything familiar. I don't want to see anybody familiar. I want to go to a new place and I want to just let myself be different than I was before the breakup and after the breakup. And that's a gift that Emma is able to procure for Harriet. So yes, it's practical and yes, it's kind of contrived on Jane Austen's part, but yeah, I buy it. I'm good with that. I hope you noticed that Jane Austen made a big deal about this letter from Frank Churchill being a very thick letter. If you recall, we had talked before about how uh, the Austens, but also the Brontes, everybody, they wrote with crossings. So you would write from top to bottom on the first side of a, a thick piece of, piece of paper, flip it over, you would write from top to bottom, avoiding the area where you are going to uh, address and seal the letter, but you can any of the real estate that isn't going to show you can use. And then once you have used that up, instead of getting another piece of paper, you would turn the paper sideways on the first side and write sideways, crossing all of the writing that you'd done before, which if your penmanship was particularly good would be fine. But if you wrote like me, it would not be at all, especially with a quill pen. But this this idea of having a, a commentable thick letter to me indicates that Frank has no crossings in this one. He has demonstrated by the format that he has written this letter how much he respects Mrs. Weston and her husband, his father, and Emma. This is not a letter that he just fired off quickly. This is clearly stuff that had been percolating for him in a long time, and it's it's taken him some time to write. I also did love in Mrs. Weston's introduction to Frank's letter, the idea about it having been an ungenial morning. And though you will never own being affected by the weather, Emma, like her dad is, I think everybody feels a northeast wind. And that was, to me, that was like such a callback 
to predating, but a, a callback to Mr. Jarndyce in Bleak House, which is up in all the membership platforms and about to be up on the craftlet.com membership site. For the last two weeks, I have had a guy trying to fix some code on the website so that we can put players, instead of making you download everything, we can put players on the site uh, that work for our audiobooks. And I, I think last night at midnight, it got fixed. I'm going to go check on it right now. But so far, I have uh, two different books that are up on the uh, membership.com website. They're things that are already up on the, the other platforms. And if you have signed up as a premium member over at craftlit.com slash premium, you should have, and I put should in emphasis because it's hard to know, you should have gotten an email from me. So check your spam folder if you didn't. It should have come from me, from Heather at craftlit.com. And it should show you the first book that I uploaded. Those emails will be coming out automatically every Thursday, letting you know which which books we have added because we do have a back catalog of books that we need to add. So yeah, Mr. Jarndyce, Bleak House. It is in the, the shop if you want to get yourself a copy of, you know, what is it, 32 hours of audio? It may be more than that, honestly. Um, but oh, what a good book. I love that book. I also really loved the way Frank talked about his father, that he he was pretty sure he was going to be forgiven by Mrs. Weston because even if, she, if he wasn't forgiven, he she, she would never act like he wasn't forgiven. You know, she's classy is what I'm saying. But I loved the way he phrased that he had the advantage of inheriting a disposition to hope for good, which no inheritance inheritance of houses or lands can ever equal the value of. It's just a lovely little dad tribute, but also he's very clear. He knows he is going to have some work to do to make up for the many years that he has not spent visiting and the fact that he didn't come see Mrs. Weston in a more timely manner because that is something that his dad definitely did feel. And I understand that. And Frank knows he's got some some work to do to show his dad, not just say he's sorry, but to show his dad that he can be he can be a good guy. He also gives Emma more credit than she deserves. She may not have surmised the whole, but her quickness must have penetrated a part. I cannot doubt it of Frank and Jane Fairfax's subterfuge. And no, she got nothing. Knightley is the one who figured it out. Not Emma, but Frank. Frank is very generous there. And I, and I think probably actually does believe that. Why would he not? Emma did not talk about, you know, trying to nudge Frank and Harriet together. She didn't talk about it with Frank, so he would have no reason to wonder about it. I also did love his rip apart of the Eltons when he when he launched into the Eltons, and I love Knightley's <laughs> Knightley's commentary on it too. I must not quarrel with the spirit of forbearance which has been so richly extended towards myself, but otherwise I should loudly protest against the share of it which that woman has known. And then it's an M dash. Jane, indeed! Exclamation point. M dash. You will observe that I have not yet indulged myself in calling her by that name, even to you. Think then what I must have endured in hearing it bandied about between the Eltons with all the vulgarity of needless repetition and all the insolence of imaginary superiority. And then says, have patience with me, I shall soon have done, M dash. And then goes back to telling how Jane basically broke up with him and said that she was going to go be a governess because Frank's being a dork. I found, back from Sense and Sensibility, I found an Instagram post that I did that said, he is just a cad. A quote by, underneath it, every craftlet listener. And it was talking about Willoughby. And so now I, I feel like maybe I should be making, actually, not a cad. At least I feel like, not a cad, Frank Churchill. I, sometimes the movies do kind of play him more as a villainous, careless and I mean that in the, the two-word sense. He has not enough care in his heart to have recognized that he screwed up. I don't think that's the real. And for you persuasion lovers out there, I wondered if you you caught this at the end of Frank's letter. Uh, Captain Wentworth, at the end of Volume 2 in Persuasion, when he and Anne Elliot have finally started to uh, recognize that this, this might work, he said, like other great men under reverses, he added with a smile, I must endeavor to subdue my mind to my fortune. I must learn to brook being happier than I deserve. And she has a callback to that here with Frank. If you think me in a way to be happier than I deserve, I am quite of your opinion. Even if that's him trying to be charming and say the right thing, he is, in fact, saying the right thing. He is happier than he deserves. And he is a child of fortune. And it's nice that he 
at least pays lip service to it because a lot of times people in these positions just think that it's because they're better instead of luckier. So it's it's kind of nice to see somebody who grokks that. And Knightley's reading of the the letter is just charming. I, I had so much fun listening to it, but I don't know. I didn't catch it until I looked at it on paper. Do you remember back when Emma was first like, Knightley? Oh, Knightley couldn't marry Jane Fairfax. That would be horrible if Mr. Knightley did that because 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 our his nephew, Henry, whose rights are going to be squandered if, you know, his rights to Donwell Abbey, if he loses the heirship of all of this, H-E-I-R, not A-I-R. And then Jane Austen does say, in thinking of Donwell Abbey now, she was never struck with any sense of injury to her nephew, Henry, whose rights, as heir expectant, had formerly been so tenaciously regarded. Now that it's her, it's like, yeah, Henry, too bad, so sad. Sorry, I'm here now. Bye. <laughs> because she is still is she even 21 yet? I don't even know if she's 21 yet. She may still just be 20. Emma. And Knightley. And Frank. It's all the knots are untying beautifully. Kind of like most of Nobody Wants That on Netflix. I wish I were getting a kickback from them for this, but I'm not. <laughs> but, uh. Yes, it's fun. Last two things before I let you get out of here. Back when I was young and innocent and living in Southern California, um, and even when I was living in Arizona, when I finally got to be old enough that I was able to vote, which I have done every single election that I've been able to vote in, I know that at least in Southern California, and I'm pretty sure in Arizona too, we used to get these little, I don't know, five by seven, five by eight newsprint booklets in the mail for free. They just came out to everybody, media mail, pennies on the dollar. And in it, the League of Women Voters had gone down. And this was particularly important in California where you have propositions like Proposition 13 and Proposition 8. There have been some famous ones that have made national news. Those propositions are often written in a way to obfuscate what's going on. Like I remember there was something like clean, our clean waterways bill, and it was actually to open oil derrick rights closer into the coast than had been previously allowed. So the the Clean Ocean Act or the Clean Water Act was what they called it. But if you could get through the complexity of the way they'd written it, because they were really trying to put one over on everybody, kind of the same way that Ohio just did um, with their previous little election recently, the League of Women Voters, nonpartisan, Republicans, Democrats, independents, all working together for clarity. They would make sure in these little booklets that you knew who was funding it, what a simple text version of the proposition actually was, if there had been any costs assigned to it, like by the Congressional Bud Budget Office, that kind of thing, and likely implications if the thing passed, and also likely implications if it didn't pass. Which sounds like, why Why would you put both? If, you're, if you put implications when it would pass, you understand what the implications would be if it didn't. And actually, no, it's not true. Sometimes a thing not passing has worse repercussions because some other bill is going to end its life cycle. And if it's not replaced with something new slash better, there will be consequences. And those things aren't always obvious because we don't have these things memorized. Thank you. We have other things to do. Reason I bring it up is because League of Women Voters is still out there. They are not publishing these little booklets anymore, but there are two different places where you can get at their information. One is vote411.org, where you can actually get, like if you if you pull up for your local representatives, sometimes you know who your representatives are, sometimes you don't, but you can pull them up and see a comparative breakdown, like a bullet point breakdown of the things that they are saying are on their personal platform. If they're already serving, I think sometimes they include voting record information. Um, they're doing the same thing, as I mentioned before, for propositions and things like that in states. You go on vote411.org and put in your state and put in your county, and you can look up the deets on anybody. I also found the actual League of Women Voters website as well. Now that I know that they're still in existence, I am going to see if I can volunteer for them because I really do respect the uh, razor's edge that they were always able to walk. Nobody ever could accuse them of partisanship. They have historically been, I think, some of the most moral upright in it for the democracy people ever. And and I'm just thrilled to know that they they still exist. I miss the little 
newsprint things, though. I, we got other crappy newsprint things in the mail. Why can't I get a good one? All right, I'm going to go sulk about newsprint right now, and you have a great week. I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes, thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craftlit channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that craftlit lives. It's it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome makers and readers and people who hadn't been readers before, but are now. I like that. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.